virtual space from which we will speak with you. I want to thank my colleagues who have spoken before me for their powerful presentations. And um, there is so much to say. So what, where do we begin? How do we start? I'm reminded of Garth sometimes when he's on his program. Um, he, he's just, this is so much, isn't it? And it is because we are seeing a government that is on free fall in every single sector. The others would have spoken, health sector, education sector, the business sector. Um, Sean spoke tonight with respect to what's happening in national security and so on. So it almost, in every sector I will say, the government is in free fall. And what that means is that our citizens are on the ground. Our citizens are getting, to, being put underground because of the incompetence and the failure of this government. There are many things I can talk about, as I say, but tonight I really want to speak about something which I think is a total hijacking, totally wrong and illegal once again on the part of the government with respect to their pronouncements about what they want to do with the Tobago House of Assembly elections. You see, when you come to interfere with democratic institutions, the institutions which uphold the rule of law, then the very foundations of your country, of your society, are being shaken, shaken off the ground, as I say, to throw us all on the ground and then underground. And this latest announcement and pronouncement by Prime Minister Rowley on Friday in the Parliament, laying the THA amendment bill in the Parliament, and then saying, look, we will debate this next Friday. So he drops this on the population. There has been no consultation with the representatives of the THA in Tobago, except for the PNM reps. There has been no consultation with the people of Tobago. And it is indeed the plan, the proposal is to subvert the democratic will of the people of Trinidad to be going to understand this. It's not simply about breaking a tie. That's not what it is about. It is a PNM in the way they've always operated to use the institutions of our nation to subvert democracy. And how do they want to do that? Well, I'll come to it in a moment. So here we are. I see that as an obscene grab for power by Rowley and his PNM in Tobago. They got such a licking in Tobago, I don't think they've recovered yet. And so they want to punish the people of Tobago by coming to the parliament to do what? To change the law. And tonight I will tell you, that piece of law they are bringing, they are saying is for a simple majority. Well, they are very wrong, as they've been so wrong before. The Prime Minister said he got legal advice. But tell us who gave you this legal advice? Tell them how much it costs you to get wrong legal advice. Because there's already in the law of our land, existing law, a tiebreaker for the circumstances as such as happened in the THA election. But you don't want that tiebreaker because you want to come to use your friends and family in the EBC to gerrymander the boundaries to give the PNM a victory where there was none. That is how I see it. It's an obscene grab for power and to interfere with our democracy and our independent institutions. So the bill comes, that THA amendment bill, trying to push down our throats in one week, in one week, what they've been trying to do in many other ways with another THA amendment bill, which they've had on the order paper forever, forever, which has been before a joint select committee, and they can't get it done because they really don't want to give Tobago self-government. Let us be real, that bill was to give Tobago self-government. They don't really want that. And so five years went, came and went, we into a sixth year. Now you bring a piecemeal piece of bill to say you want to break a tie. I want to tell you that you are being a hypocrite. You're fooling the population. You're fooling the country. You don't want to break tie. You want to entrench the PNM in Tobago using law by simple majority when what you need is a special majority, when what you need is consultation with the people of Tobago, man. How can you just come from on top of the pile, on top of the heap, and drop this thing in the parliament on Friday? 
Who did you consult with? I ask again. Tracy, Tricky Tracy, Tricky Tracy. That's the person you want to entrench there to run the affairs in Tobago. You say, we did not interfere in Tobago's affairs because the people of Tobago are perfectly capable of self-government. I brought a bill when we were in government. And guess what? You know what happened? The Rowley PNM did not support it. As I said, they came five years now, come and gone, still cannot find it. So what do you do? You bring this piece of bill. Because of the licking you got in Tobago, you went in with so many seats. The PDP went in with so many seats, they came out, they had two. They came out with six. You went in with 10, how much you come out with? Six. If that is not a licking, well then, I will be born again. I'll be born again, if that's not a licking. So, what is the issue then? First of all, there is a tiebreaker in the law, in the existing law, and I'll tell you, I know it well, because I was prime minister at the time when we changed the law to deal with issues where you have a deadlock. You remember that 18, 18 time in the parliament? You all remember that a few years ago? And for a whole year, the parliament did not sit. It's only many time for the budget came up, about a year later, that they called an election. Because parliament wasn't sitting, you can't pass any law, you can't pass a budget, and therefore it's only when you run out of money you can't spend. You came to the parliament, you dissolved, you didn't come, you dissolved the parliament. And we had a fresh election. So after that, and for many years, our parliament has been running on standing orders from 1962, made under our constitution and so on. Standing orders for the parliament were made in 1962. But during many years, parliamentarians, the parliament I belong to as prime minister and previous ones, they were working on bringing the standards up to modern day times to deal with issues. And one of the issues was that 1818 time we faced in the parliament. In 2013, 14, we set up a standing orders committee in the parliament. And you'll see why in a minute why it's important because it applies to Tobago as well. We set up that standing orders committee and they changed and made many things, many changes to the standing orders. And we produced these standing orders of the House of Representatives 2015. And in these standing orders, in order to make it the law for the House of Representatives, we had to go to Parliament. And we went to Parliament and we brought a motion to adopt these new standing orders. We went in 2014 to adopt the new standing orders. And you know what was one of the things in here? It was a provision under standing order four that where there is a tie in the MPs in the parliament that you will resolve the issue by drawing lots. That's here. That's here today. We'll come back how it applies to Tobago in a minute. I know it. I did it. I passed it. We did it. We passed it. And I'll tell you, every member of the parliament who was sitting that day, on the 14th of March, 2014, in the parliament, every one of the 33 members, do you know what they did? They voted unanimously to support the changes in the standing orders. So let me give you some of the names who voted. That's a very interesting thing. Because today they are pretending it doesn't exist. They don't know about it. Hear the names, every single one, you know, everyone. There were 33 of us on that day. And at that time, we had already changed. Um, we had, uh, in, in the house, we didn't have a deadlock parliament anymore. We had to go in with the 41 members. And yet still, we put in the tiebreaker. They're saying in the THA, you don't want a tiebreaker like that. Let's increase the number of seats. But even when you increase the number of seats, first of all, I don't agree to increase it. I'll come to that in a moment. So you say you want to go to 15 seats in Tobago. So why not 13? You have 12 now. If you really, all you wanted to do was put an uneven number to prevent a tire deadlock, well, why 15? What's the rationale? Please tell us. What's your rationale? So you want to put 15 seats and say, oh, that's how we break the tie. But listen to this. When we were doing the... Uh, 
the, I'll come back to the names, when we were doing the standing orders and approving it, well, them fellas real talk, you know. You should hear him, but he said, I am so happy with this. I'll quote it to you in a minute. This is fantastic. All over the world, you have tiebreakers by drawing lots. This is the way to go. <coughs> because even if you have an uneven number of seats, things could happen. One member could get ill on the day to take the vote, stay away. And what will happen? You're deadlock again. One member might fall sick. One member may abstain, and you're still in the deadlock. So even you change the number of seats to make it uneven, there is no guarantee that you will break the tie. And this was the way we looked at other jurisdictions. We say draw lots. Right here in our country, it had been the law for many of the local government regional corporations that you break the tie. How? By drawing lots. It has happened in the Superior Corporation many times. Councilor Vic, um, you will know that, Ramona. It has happened, MP for my arrow will know, in my arrow. How did you break the tie? Draw lots. Now there's a risk. The lot could go your side or right side. It will then be in the hands of the Lord, basically. But it will be the fairest way, rather than increasing seats, rather than getting EBC to draw boundaries. Boundaries are drawn in this country with no equity, no equality of representation. And here it is, everybody who was in that house voted. Here are the names. Munilal, Honorable Dr. Rula Munilal, Honorable Errol McLeod, Honorable Chandrish Sharma, Honorable Prakash Ramada, Honorable Winston Peters, Honorable Suraj Rambachan, Honorable Carlin Sipasad Bachan, Honorable Simangal, Honorable Roberts, Honorable KDs, Honorable Baksh, Honorable Dr. Rupert Griffith, Honorable Ram uh, Ramadas Singh, Dikoto, Khan, Indar Singh, Rupna Ryan, Ramdial, Alain Toppin, from Tobago, Colin Partap, Marlene McDonnell, Dr. Keith Rowley, then opposition leader, voted yes to change it. Donna Cox, who is now minister in this government. Hippolyte, Mr. Colin Imbert, minister in this government, like they forget this. They forgot that they voted for this tiebreaker. Fitzgerald Jeffrey, Terence D. Al Singh, Dr. Brown, Mrs. Thomas, Hospitalis, Gopi Schoon, Kamala Prasad, B. Sessa, Jack Warner. All 33 members said, yes, let's change these outdated standing orders. But in doing that, let us also put a tiebreaker for the election of a speaker. How? By lots. They voted. Listen to, um, listen to some of these guys. They have short memories, very short memories when you listen to their words. First of all, Dr. Munilal, who was then leader of government business for us, he moved a motion that the parliament as a whole, government opposition, should be proud to be here to participate in this debate. The election of a speaker, to avoid the repeat of the 2002 deadlock, we are now putting a tiebreaker. Dr. Keith Rowley, 21st February 2014, Hansard, page 412, and I quote, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I rise to join this debate on this, what I consider to be a watershed moment. Is that the same person now? Talking about change the law, put 15 seats, let um, the chief secretary and whoever and whoever decide to call a new election. I consider it to be a watershed moment because if we get this done right, Mr. Speaker, significant positive changes have come today management of the affairs of Trinidad and Tobago. I want to associate myself with most of the comments made by my colleague from Oropuchi East. You know who was that? Dr. Rudy Murrell, the same fellow they want to meet on the pavement. Page 413, he says, Mr. Speaker, 1961, I had not yet written common entrance. And it is against that background that today, having the opportunity to join my other colleagues in this house, to address this very important matter that I feel the sense of some satisfaction that we are at a point where we can make some significant impact. Dr. Rowley, then 2014. 
What these standing orders in their recommended version are meant to do, Mr. Speaker, is to bring the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago into the 21st century. He says further, today I am particularly pleased to be involved in these proceedings and hope against all hope that as quickly as possible we'll move as a Parliament, working hand in step to do what is right. We have a new Prime Minister, he says, and a new opposition leader. And I gave the commitment that on behalf of my party and all those I represent in this country, to all the people of TNT, that will support and so on. This is the man who is today saying there is no law. When he was there, when we put the tiebreaker in, and you will still be asking me, I know, how does it apply to Tobago? Well, let me read column in, but the worst finance minister ever. Today, they talk on the left side of the mouth, and tomorrow, right side. Left foot, right foot, balance issues. That's what they are. Hypocrites. Inconsistent. Column member at 14, March 2014, page 41. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it gives me pleasure to join this debate. Especially, I, I, was, as I, I was a member of the committee. Minister Ember then was a member of this committee. I was a member of the committee that reported and made recommendations with respect to revision of the standing orders. So we just went through the process, nominated one name, we each nominated, we got a committee going. Then he goes further to say, what is proposed now is that in the event of a tie, and this is for the election of a speaker, the clerk shall proceed in accordance with paragraph 10 of the standing orders, and paragraph 10 of these standing orders, which is standing order 410. What does it say? Draw lots. In the event of a tie, when you're electing a speaker, you draw lots. So I will tell you, he says, the clerk will draw a straw and decide. He says further. Now one might say that that is an unfair and undemocratic way of doing things. But that is a standard practice in many jurisdictions. This is imbert. That when you have an election, votes are tied, you have to find some way of determining who the winner is. And in this case, what is proposed? The clerk will determine by lot, just drawing lots, as to who the speaker will be. And who is the speaker? The speaker is the presiding officer of the House. So what it will mean, although it is unlikely, hear this, because we now have an uneven number of parliamentarians, so he said, even with an uneven number of parliamentarians, but it could happen at some time in the future that when they change the composition of the House, we might come back to equal number. We have to have a tie. In this case, Clark will determine my lot, which candidate and so on will be eliminated. And you will have a speaker. But at least a parliament can run because a speaker will be elected. You will have a presiding officer who will be in charge of the parliament. So that is one innovation which I warmly endorse in the new proposed standing orders. You see these hypocrites? He goes on. This current speaker pushed and pushed and pushed and got this done. You know as a current speaker? Fellow name, Wade Mark. Pushed and pushed. And he must get some of the credit for us modernizing our and there was a break there, but he said, I'm giving credit where credit is due. So, Mr. Speaker, I hope we can adjust the speaking times and so on, and we had some other changes. And myself, speaking on the 28th of July, I said, I'm very pleased to see, today on my table, since 1961, how many years is that now? We have now amending the standard orders of this parliament after so many years, 53 years later. We now have new standard orders to take effect in the next session. So this is what happened in the House. There is in the existing law a tiebreaker. There is no need to come to Parliament to change the law. There is no need for the intervention of the EBC. There is no need for a fresh election. You have the tiebreaker. And how? Because the standing orders of the THA provide specifically in Standing Order 92. You know what it provides? Let me read it. Rather than um, quote incorrectly, Standing Order 92 says, 
So first, they have standing order three, goes through the same process that they've been doing over and over, trying to elect a presiding officer, and what happened? Deadlock, deadlock, deadlock. So what do you do that? You do that in perpetuity, or you wait for Rowley to come and change the law in the parliament when you have the law already? You go on to your other standing orders, and our own standing orders in standard, um, standing order two, two of this one for the House, it tells you in any matter that you are silent in these standing orders, you revert to the practice and procedure of the British Parliament. That's exactly what happens with the THA Standing Order 92. And this is what it says. THA Standing Orders 92. In any matter, not hearing provided for, it shall be had to the usage and practice of the House of Representatives of Trinidad and Tobago, which shall be followed as far as the same may be applicable to this assembly. So what does it tell you to do? Where these standing orders of the THA are silent, where are you going? To the standing orders of the House of Representatives. And standing order 410 tells us very clearly, where there's a tie, you break the tie how? By the clerk drawing lots. So why are you coming to the parliament to change the law? Why? I think you're up to no good. Why don't you use the existing law? A law that you approved and you spoke so warmly and praisefully about, praiseworthy about. Why are you coming now to change the law? Why do you want to put 15 people? Listen to this. You have the law. Use the law. Do not come to subvert the will of the electorate in Tobago, because that's what you're going to do. And you're going to do more. But before I go there, I want to ask you this. Why 15 seats? Tobago, THA, has 51,062 voters. You now have 12 seats. You want to go to 15 seats. Again, why, what, where? Why 15? Where you pick that out? Which hat? When you were playing sailor and what it is, sailors and sails over the weekend. Where did you pick up this 15 from? Because look at this. Trinidad has 1,079,976 voters for local elections. There are 139 local electoral districts. But hear this. The San Fernando City Corporation has 50,000 voters, similar to THA. How many seats they have? Nine. The Shigonas Borough Corporation has 68,073. How many seats they have? Eight. The Kuva Tabaki Talparo Corporation has 150,670 voters. How many seats they have? 14. But Tobago has 51,000 just above. And you want to put 15 seats. Let's continue. It's more than that. You go down to Dago Martin Corporation, 89,190 voters with 10 seats. Where's the equity? Where's the equality of representation? What is your rationale? You say you want to break a tie, and I'm saying to you tonight, you lie. You don't want to break no tie. You want to break the democratic will of the people of Tobago. We move along. Penal Debe Corporation, 77,840 voters. How many seats? 10. Princess Song Corporation, 83,037 voters. How many seats? 10. But you want 51,000 voters to get how many? 15 seats. Moving along. Samoa Lavanti Corporation, 136,000. 304 voters. How many seats? 14. Tunapuna Piaco Corporation. 178,067 voters. How many seats? 16. So how are we arriving with 51,000 voters with 15 seats? That's one issue. And this is about equality of representation. This is about equity. And this is about democracy. <coughs> so you need to explain that to us as well. There we are with the numbers. There we were with the law. But I'm not done with the law. I'm not done with the law. 
You have the proposed tiebreaker from Prime Minister Rowley, wants to bring 15 seats, and I've said to you, look at the discrimination, look at the inequity in that. But there's another very important issue. There is something in our law that you have what I call accrued rights. Accrued rights. That when a piece of law gives you a right, you cannot come and take it away by a simple majority vote. You cannot come and just change the law just because p and have the majority and say, okay, simple majority. You can't. You cannot take away a right that is accrued. And under the THA Act, the 12 assemblymen who were elected on January 25th have accrued rights. Because when they were elected, they were elected under the THA Act, which says that you shall hold office for four years. You will hold office for four years. And the assembly cannot be dissolved sooner unless the assembly itself meets and dissolves, but they have not been duly constituted, so they cannot meet to dissolve themselves. And therefore, these assemblymen have rights for four years. And you know what kind of rights? Very important rights. Russia and talking about salary and so on. What are their rights? They have a kind of crude right to four years of pay. And you know what pays and money is? Sean is here, the lawyer, he will understand. That is property rights. Your salary, your money, that is property rights. So you just can't come in the parliament with a simple majority vote and take away those rights by saying we are going to dissolve this THA is going to be dissolved within a month or two months and new elections. That is madness. It is madness. It's contrary to law. And therefore, we will stand up for what we see as being right. They will say, I'm desperate. And you know what they all like to say? Delusional and all the foolishness. But they're the foolish ones. They're the hypocrites. And they are the ones subverting the democracy of our country. Subverting and, you know, really taking away, abrogating the rights and, you know, democratic rights, the rule of law in our country. That's what they're doing. So there is a tiebreaker. You have accrued rights. And then the question is, how long this thing going on take, boy? You say, OK, let's pass a law in parliament. Then the EBC will come to change boundaries. Well, anytime you hear that, get frightened. Eh? Anytime you hear that, get frightened. Because they have placed their people and their family inside of the EBC. What trust can we have? that we will have a democracy and a proper function in EBC. I have serious doubts. I'm not accusing anyone, but oh God, man, this thing looking really bad now. You want to change boundaries? You want to change number of seats? How? With a simple majority in the parliament? Well, we are not going to support it. And you will be challenged in the courthouse. We have court closed. We have court closed. So the accrued rights now being breached. There's a whole as, as Faris likes to say, all suite of cases <laughs> in the jurisprudence. A long line of cases coming from all over the Commonwealth about accrued rights. All in their own jurisdictions or region where? Up in the Privy Council. We had one right here in the Privy Council. You remember this infamous Section 34 during my time in office? It didn't last. Nobody accrued any rights under that. But we had put in the law, in the Senate, they had put in the Section 34 that people could apply to the court to have their cases dismissed. When we discovered what the extent of that, we moved immediately, I did, immediately into the parliament to repeal that Section 34. So the guys, some of them, they filed cases to say that we were taking away their crude right, the right to go to the court and have the case dismissed so they wouldn't have the criminal charges against them and so on. And the Privy Council held, yes, you may accrue rights, but it's only if the law now taking away those rights are specific to you. And the court held, the case was Maritime and Ferguson versus the Attorney General, went right up Privy Council. The court said, listen, you can't have a right that is specific to you with this. This was for everybody. So you're not being handpicked. They call it ad hominem law. That's just because of you. You see you, we're coming for you. We're locking you. We're not giving you a bill till 3 o'clock in the morning. Other people get locked up, you know. 
recently in front of parliament, what happened? They let them go the same day in the daytime. Some other people lock up, they keep them there till 3 a.m. And had to get bail, the others just go on. They didn't have to get bail, they just go. One law for one and one law for somebody else in this country. So let me get back to the accrued rights. The court said this is not targeting you. This is a law of what they call general application. Not a specific application, so that this, it becomes what is called ad hominem legislation. But in the case of the assemblyman, it is specifically designed against them, is it not? The only people going and lost their work will be those assemblymen before the four years. So this is clearly, specifically designed to work against specific persons. It's not going to affect everybody in the country. It's not going to, like in the other one I mentioned, it affected all persons on charges from way back when. This is specifically about these assemblymen. It is clear in my respectful view, ad hominem legislation. And it is therefore contrary to law and in breach of all the fundamental principles of the rule of law for the government to attempt to do this in the manner that they're doing it. So those are some points that um, I will raise with you on the THA matter. We'll talk more about it. I find it very passing strange that where are the voices of these legal minds? Where are they? How come no one is saying anything that the law exists. The THA standing orders say go to the house standing orders. The THA 92 says go. And you know, when you look at um, our standing order for election of a speaker, and our standing order seven, seven says the speaker of the house is the presiding officer. In the THA, presiding officer is the equivalent of our speaker. And the procedure set out in the THA standing orders, they are identical in 99.9% .9 of the respects to the standing orders of our house to elect the speaker. The difference is they are silent about the tiebreaker. But our standing order 410, which I read for you, is clear that the clerk shall draw lots. So what is the problem? Why you want to go and spend all this money again to call an election? And when will you call it? A year? How long will it take to do all these boundaries? Why? Why? When you already have recourse to the existing law. So something, as I say, is not right here. I think they're up to really ulterior motives in, in, in trying to come to the house to pass this piece of law, and we'll see how it plays out as the days go by. There is, as I said, a lot to talk about, but I, I, felt, I felt compelled today to speak on this matter because of the way they, they're attempting to rush it through the parliament with no consultation with anybody. In fact, I would say no consultation um, with Tobago. There's been none with Trinidad either. So this is law from law, from law, from law, from the executive alone, from Prime Minister and his cabinet. This is not a fiefdom. This is a democracy. We are guided by constitutional principles of the rule of law. We are guided by the separation of powers. It's all like big words, but you see those words are very, very important. And for those of you asking the UNC, what is our position on fighting crime? I will tell you very clearly, the UNC stands on the side of all law-abiding citizens. The UNC will stand on the side of all law-abiding citizens and you're innocent until you're proven guilty. You're innocent until you're proven guilty. They say emotions are running high, so we shouldn't talk about the rights of everybody. The day they break down your door to pick up your daughter or your son and they get no justice, they're found guilty before any court of law could even have a part to play. I wonder what you will say then. But when it's somebody else, daughter and son, you say, oh God, so much crime. All these women getting killed and this one getting killed. Hello. Do not become the monster. You're trying to fight a monster, but do not become the monster. Uh, you're trying to fight a monster. You don't want to look in a mirror and become that monster because you're fighting a monster. So we stand, I make it very clear, on the side of justice. On the side of the rule of law, we stand on behalf of all law-abiding citizens, and every citizen is entitled to due process of law. That is where we stand. I make no bones about it.
So if some people are unhappy with our position, the day the rule of law breaks down in this land, we will have a police state. We will have a dictatorship. So don't let them bully you. The people call me all day today, you know, tell me, hey, Kamala, oh God, man, them criminal on them, them criminal. How you know it's a criminal until, they, until they're found guilty? How do you know? And I say, you only do that because you feel you're outside the sweep. Ask them, go be saying they put them in handcuff and walking up and down for the Spain. You feel it will never come to you. It will come to you when you fight monster and you become a monster. It's going to come home in your house. It will come home. So tomorrow somebody will cuss me up again, but it's okay, my back broad. <laughs> it wouldn't be the first time. It will, be not, will not be the last time, but I assure you, as I always do, I will fight for you. I will fight for your rights. I will stand up for you. Because today is your child. Tomorrow is my child. Always remember that. Always remember that. Sean is a, a lawyer, understands that well. There must be due process. There must be due process. You are innocent until you are proven guilty. So let there be the investigations. Those who have done the wrong, they say we do the crime, you do the time. Those who have been against the law, those who have acted against law, against law abiding citizens and so on, yes, you do the crime, do the time. But you cannot do the time before due process is followed. So I love you all. I know we've had a very hard week, a hard few days, a hard few years, but never ever give up hope. As long as we continue to fight for what is right, we will have hope to continue the battle. So I ask you to stand with us. We will not give up. We will fight. We will fight them inside the parliament, outside the parliament, and inside the courthouse. They now have a kind of pattern of behavior, like Faris forgot he was a lawyer. And Stuart don't forget he's a lawyer. And Heinz forget he's a lawyer. They're just attacking lawyers everywhere. Again, I say, when it is you or your child or your family, who are you looking for? Ask the boys again, look up the other night. Who are you looking for? A lawyer. Lawyers are there to uphold the law. They're there to see that justice is done. But they have started at, well, look. They don't just attack lawyers. They just attack everybody, anybody, everybody and anybody. The economists tell you you're talking foolishness, but the government is talking nonsense, you attack them. They are a whole attack game. I know gosh, well, UNC do escape from the crosshairs at all. Not at all. If they don't call UNC name once for the day, I feel them fellas just can't eat and sleep properly. If they don't call Kamala name once for the day, every time you pick up, every time they speak, is UNC and UNC. We are so powerful. God bless you. I am UNC. And I am very proud. God bless you all. Thank you.